ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Heads up, this episode of Schmeitgeist contains strong language and mental health themes. So I've been investigating the ADHD diagnosis wave for months now. Like, up close. For one, I'm part of it. And at every stage, with everyone I speak to, there have been glimpses of how extreme the situation is. It's playing out on ADHD helplines. Year on year, the call centres are getting flooded more and more. The numbers have, you know, doubled, if not tripled. With the ADHD psychiatrists, whose books have been shut for years. I opened my books for literally 48 hours and we had 70 new referrals. I reckon I went into emotional paralysis. I can't choose who's going to get fed. But loudest of all, you can hear it from ADHD patients. I've had situations where you ring up and it just goes straight to a message bank just saying we're not taking bookings at the moment. <laughs> and it just hangs up on you. Because so many people are missing out, either because they can't get an appointment or they can't afford the one they're given. I thought it was a typo when I first read it because I was like, how on earth can something like this cost two and a half thousand dollars because I just can't do it. It was disgusting and actually cashing in on people's disadvantage, which is just horrific. I think I was in there once or twice, a couple of phone calls. Like, I don't know where the money goes, if you know what I mean. I'm Angela Wapier, and this is Schmeitgeist, the podcast from ABC Everyday that decodes the biggest and weirdest trends in pop culture, coming to you from Gadigal land. This is part two of our investigation into the ADHD diagnosis wave. Part one was all about how we got here. And now we want to show you how broken the system is. We don't have the door open for anybody to come through the door. So there's no wait list. There's no wait list. There is a new kind of business that's emerged with those desperate people in mind. Telehealth-only ADHD specialist clinics. And some of them are charging patients up to $3,000 just for an assessment. It's actually horrendous. In some cases, there's just blatant price gouging and complete exploitation. And if you think we're exaggerating, then you should see the recruitment emails. I have, and some of them are promising psychiatrists an annual income of more than $900,000. And the reason they can is right now, patients have no alternative but to pay. So we have two questions. Firstly, are those patients getting the right treatment? If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And then if you are charging a great deal of money, you also have people who almost expect a diagnosis. You know, I've come and I've paid, and therefore, how could you not diagnose me? And secondly, what happens to the people who can't afford to pay? Just looked at myself and meet other people and thought, how the hell would I be a dad? You know, I can't concentrate, I can't stick to things, you know, I can't, can't look after myself, let alone a kid. The suicide rate is higher in people with ADHD, particularly those who have ADHD and substance use, untreated ADHD, on average will reduce a person's life expectancy for about a decade. I, I was using meth about three years, three and a half years, but that was like everyday use. People were using it to get that massive dopamine release, and I was using it to just feel normal. A lot of people throw up their hands, they see this as an intractable problem or just wait for this wave to go away. No, no it's not. You say there is a solution. Yes. Today on Schmeitgeist, our warped system for treating ADHD. Who's getting hurt by it, who's making bank off it and how we might be able to fix it. OK, so this might be the strangest episode of Schmeitgeist we have ever made. And we pride ourselves on going to strange places on this podcast. But this episode is strange in a different way, because this is an episode we didn't actually set out to make. We were doing what we normally do, which is follow an internet rabbit hole, in this case ADHD content, all the way to the end. But this rabbit hole didn't so much end as lead us to a bigger story. And we didn't want to ignore that. So for the last few months, we've been talking to a lot of people, psychiatrists, GPs, patients, support groups, everyone we could. And the episode you're about to hear is everything we found. So you're going to be hearing snippets of multiple patient stories throughout the episode, starting with a woman named Anita Wall. So I was ringing around trying to find different places and I, I did 
get one place and it was hit one for this, hit two for this, hit three for that, and then hit four for ADHD assessments. So I hit that number and it didn't answer, it didn't ring, it just went to nothing and hung up. Like some sort of cruel inverted prank call. And the first thing that stood out about Anita's story is how she wound up there. Because unlike most of the people we've spoken to, Anita already had an ADHD diagnosis from several years ago. And a psychiatrist, actually. Until he disappeared. Yeah, so when I went back to organise my biannual review, I was told by the clinic that he's no longer consulting from this clinic and that he's closed his books and no longer seeing clients. And I was not made aware of that. So their books were completely full. They couldn't help me. So then I had to go on a period of months trying to find another psychiatrist who could then give me my review so that I could access my medications because you you couldn't just book him with anyone and get it. So like Anita said... Even once you have an ADHD diagnosis, you still need to be reviewed by a psychiatrist every two years, if you want meds. And sometimes that is a smooth process, but not always. Because as I've mentioned once or twice, we are having some supply issues when it comes to psychiatry. Like, think of the rage you've felt if you've ever left a packed bar to go outside for two minutes and then tried to go back in, only to find yourself at the back of a 20-minute queue. Only in this case, the queue takes a year. The bar is your meds, which you depend on to function, and the door guy wants at least $1,500 before he lets you inside again. My GP knew how much I was struggling trying to find a clinic to take me on, and so she gave me the name of a clinic who I then engaged. They were saying to me that I needed a complete new diagnosis and assessment, which was not true. When I challenged that, I was met with, no, 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 we do things differently. And I thought, well, hang on a minute, that's not right. I'm not paying for a whole new diagnosis. And multiple people we spoke to reported that same pattern where a clinic insists on doing its own diagnosis, even when one already exists. And it tends to play out in one of two ways. Some people pay thousands of dollars for an ADHD assessment from a psychologist, so not a doctor, only to find out they need to repeat the whole process with a psychiatrist, if they want access to medication. Then there's Anita's version, in which adults who already have an ADHD diagnosis from a doctor are pushed by a new psychiatrist to get a new diagnosis. And even if you think of that as an abundance of caution, it's a very expensive one for patients. So the clinic Anita was dealing with was exactly the kind we've been talking about. She was quoted more than $1,500 in out-of-pocket fees to be reassessed for ADHD. So that's on top of what Medicare chips in. And she had to pay half of it up front in order to secure the appointment. And if she had been re-diagnosed and ended up on their treatment plan, the clinic would have collected almost $17 thousand dollars in fees as a result, covering a psychiatrist, a clinical psychologist, a GP, and a dietitian. The out-of-pocket cost for Anita is harder to tally, but it would have landed somewhere between $4,300 and $12,000, depending on the timing of the appointments. Because at some point, Anita's Medicare safety net would have kicked in, meaning that Medicare picks up 80% of the subsequent bills that year. Although no matter which way you cut it, the clinic would still have come away with that full amount, just shy of 17 grand. It was disgusting and actually cashing in on people's disadvantage, which is just horrific. I challenged and I said, no, not on. Um, and they didn't like my answer and I didn't pay anything and I walked away. And then that's when I, I, I cried <laughs> and thought it was hopeless. Eventually, she found a different psychiatrist who did do her review, but not until after she had run out of meds. I went unmedicated for probably about two months all up. And I know that's not long, but it is for somebody that relies on um, the medication to 
get up in the morning, focus, do your work properly. It's important that we have that so that we can function. So Anita's story jumped out of the pile. The queuing, the wild quotes for a diagnosis she didn't need, running out of meds in the process. But this wasn't bad luck. I mean, it wasn't good luck either. But the point is, it's part of a pattern. I'll just get you, if you don't mind, to introduce yourself just um, briefly for the record. Of course. Uh, So my name's Christopher Wiesman. I'm a director and board member of the ADHD Foundation. So the ADHD Foundation runs a helpline, and they are busy. Well, there's definitely been an increase. So year on year, the call centres are getting flooded more and more with people who are in distress. The numbers have, you know, doubled, if not tripled. At the moment, we're looking at probably between 5,000 to 10,000 calls per annum. The projection for 2023 is triple that amount. So we're looking at probably 30,000 by the end of this year. By the end of next year... Looking at our modelling, we're looking at about 70,000 per annum. So that just gives you an indication of, obviously, the way the numbers are are certainly creeping up. Creeping up might be an understatement. We don't have the exact data for how many people have been given an ADHD diagnosis lately, but we do have prescription data as an indication. Last year, in 2022, the number of prescriptions for ADHD meds was two and a half times higher than it was in 2018. More than 3.15 million scripts – Again, in case you missed that, it more than doubled in the space of four years. And if you're wondering what could drive a spike like that, we did too. And the answer is complicated. You should go back and listen to part one if you haven't yet, where we cover it in full. But for the purposes of this story, the main thing you need to know is that we're playing catch up. Because for decades, ADHD was so poorly understood that lots of cases, maybe even most cases, weren't picked up. And naturally, in 2023, when people get a life-changing diagnosis, they post about it and what it's like living with it. Hi, what's my ADHD red flag? Uh, Not eating all day? Babe, is everything okay? You've barely touched your pile of hundreds of elaborate projects you start but never finish. Which is how we've ended up with a tsunami of ADHD content washing through social media. Memes, facts, advice, which people see and start to wonder... Wait, is this me? Which brings us back to the access crisis, because again, there is currently unprecedented demand for ADHD psychiatric services, and nowhere near enough psychiatrists to go around. And as we know only too well, whenever there's a shortage, whether that's toilet paper or vapes or ADHD psychiatry, the price goes up. Christopher Wiesman from the ADHD Foundation has been tracking the fee hike, And it's steeper than you might expect. In some cases, the fees have risen to 10 times the previous standard. Over the last decade or so, diagnosing practitioners would have charged anywhere from $200 to $600 for a diagnosis and recommended treatment. We're seeing clinics popping up everywhere, and some of them are charging up to $3,000 for a diagnosis. $3,000, that is really at the upper end of what I've heard about. How common is that? Look, we have uh, lots of anecdotal evidence to support the fact that the $3,000 is not an uncommon number. It's not one assessment in isolation. It's a series of processes that these clinics design to justify, I suppose, the cost. There might be a small percentage that's covered, but the majority in the private system is unfortunately out of pocket. Some people will charge two, three, four, five, six hundred dollars $600, and they're the reasonable people that aren't interested in gouging the markets. The average seems to be between 1500 to 2500 3000 is certainly at the extreme, but there's a lot of people charging that. The whole thing was like really freaky because it cost two and a half thousand dollars. I thought it was a typo when I first read it because I was like, two and a half thousand dollars is a huge amount of money to put on something that I have no idea what it's going to mean and if it's going to be helpful and if it's going to make a difference. And to be clear, there is nothing illegal about this. All specialists in Australia, and that includes psychiatrists, are allowed to charge whatever they want. There's literally no cap. And there are specialists in other fields charging much more than $3,000. But the reason ADHD psychiatry gets a double episode is just how quickly and how much their fees have jumped. 
The other reason is that the Australian public system doesn't really do ADHD in adults. Kids, yes, but adults, no. The best explanation I've been able to get out of anyone as to why is that publicly funded psychiatry is already so overstretched that they only have the capacity to treat some of the most urgent cases, and ADHD is generally considered less urgent than acute psychosis, for example. The upshot is, though, that unlike in, say, orthopaedics, there is no public queue to join if you can't afford private fees. So for adults with ADHD, the options are to pay up or hope it fixes itself. When I was you know, 10, 11 years old, I was so distracting to the other kids in the class, they needed to actually teach me how to be semi-organised and productive. So I've basically gone through life thinking like, ah, oh, this could be a possibility, but for whatever reason, I have never been diagnosed up until now. And that is how people end up paying so much. Because it's that or nothing. And by the way, the clinics we're talking about are incredibly cheap to run because they're almost exclusively telehealth. So those fees go straight into salaries. And the reason we know that is because we've seen the recruitment emails and text messages those clinics sent to other psychiatrists, promising enormous take-home pay. For example... We are hiring. hiring. Consultant psychiatrist. This is all in caps lock, by the way. And there are three exclamation points after the word hiring, which is not all that important in the grand scheme of things, but I wanted to include it because it's not the kind of punctuation that screams Hippocratic Oath to me. It continues. Over $900,000 per annum. Per annum. Minimum income guarantee $3,800 per day. It's entrepreneurial individuals who have seen a market need and have sought to exploit that need. They charge whatever they need to or whatever they can in order to secure the maximum amount of profit. And what they do is they seek to exploit the vulnerable. So I wanted to know what an experienced ADHD psychiatrist outside of this system might make of it. My name is David Castle. I'm a professor of psychiatry currently working in Tasmania, uh, University of Tasmania. But the views I express here are obviously my own views and not necessarily those of my employer. I'm a psychiatrist of some 30 years standing. I've got a strong academic background as well as a clinical background. And like every psychiatrist I spoke to on and off the record whilst making this episode, David is very much aware of these clinics. I mean, I have heard these uh, stories and I don't think that they cover our profession with glory. You know, I always have an issue with making money out of human unhappiness and misery. And I had a whole list of questions about this model of ADHD care, partly drawn from my own direct experience. So, like I said in part one, I got a diagnosis at the end of last year. In fact, that's how this all began. I was diagnosed at the end of a single 45-minute telehealth session, although there was a diagnostic questionnaire that I filled out ahead of time. I also submitted a short form about my medical history, which is complicated. But there were no physical checks. And as for other mental health diagnoses, which I do have... I mentioned them, and in at least one instance, the psychiatrist I spoke to more or less said, no, no, we don't agree you have that. And by the beginning of the second appointment, we were talking meds. And maybe it was my imposter syndrome kicking in, but the process felt fast, which is a weird thing for me to note in some ways, because obviously I wouldn't have been there if I didn't have a strong hunch that I had ADHD. And look, it's not so much that I think they got it wrong, but I wondered if all the brakes on this proverbial car were working. So I took it all to David Castle, a professor of psychiatry. And at the top of my list was this question. Could paying all that money mean you're more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, even if you don't have it? Well, I would hope that people who set themselves up in this way and are supposed experts would be, you know, honourable in terms of not making a diagnosis to suit the patient. But as they say, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You could fall into the trap if you're not vigilant about yourself of seeing everything as confirming a diagnosis and then if you are charging a great deal of money you also have people who almost expect a diagnosis you know I've come and I've paid and therefore how can you not diagnose me so they're all of those sort of subtexts so maybe 
David thinks that clinical relationship can be influenced by the fact you've paid $1,500 or $3,000 or however much to be there. Although there's nothing to say that that's what happened in my case. And even assuming every psychiatrist is always completely objective, I still had questions about the process. Like the telehealth only thing. And look, telehealth can be handy. You might even prefer it. But is it the right way to diagnose a person with ADHD? Especially if face-to-face isn't an option. I don't think that it's the best way to do an initial assessment. And if the initial assessment is going to be your only assessment of that individual, my suggestion would be that that is not quite optimal. It doesn't mean that it's not valid, but on a screen, you don't get the same human interaction and variation of expression and gaze and so forth. Okay, so maybe valid, but less than ideal. And David feels roughly the same way about the lack of a physical assessment. Well, psychiatrists wouldn't necessarily do a physical exam in the sense of, you know, having people unclothed and doing a full neurological examination. But somebody doing that is really important. As for being diagnosed in a single session, David is less worried about that, but also... It's not what he would do. You know, you can do a very reasonable job in a single session, but my own practice is to have at least two. And if you're unclear about it, um, have another. And the reason this matters so much is the risk that the psychiatrist could miss something important. You need to exclude other psychiatric disorders, as you quite correctly espouse, because you can get into misdiagnosis. And then on top of that are the fact that ADHD, as with many other psychiatric disorders, tend to fly in a flock with other disorders. So you have to do a proper assessment because, as you say, some of the treatments, stimulants in particular, can be quite dangerous in people with severe mood disorders, severe anxiety disorders and psychotic disorders, and that all needs to be weighed up. So there is an argument to be made that in certain clinics, some corners are being cut. And remember, they're charging a premium. David Castle is also really careful not to trash the clinics at any point. He's not using words like exploitative or disgusting, like Christopher Wiesman from the ADHD Foundation, or Anita Wall, the ADHD patient we spoke to earlier. Because the flip side of this argument, which we keep coming back to in our interview, is that for better or worse, these clinics are meeting a need. A really desperate need. And clearly, some people are so desperate that they're willing to pay. All up, it was just under two and a half thousand dollars, maybe like two thousand three hundred dollars. Yeah, really, I think I was in there once or twice, a couple of phone calls, an hour all up of actual <laughs> sitting there physically talking. I don't know where the money goes, if you know what I mean. <laughs> what is the kind of professional rationale, just trying to put ourselves in the shoes of these psychiatrists? What rationale could they offer? Well, I mean, they would say they highly trained, they gave many years of their life to their studies and they developed their skills and why shouldn't they be paid? But doctors, um, there is something different about doctors, and I actually share this about doctors, Mm -hmm. um, is that we should be better. We approached one of the clinics fitting this description for an interview, which they declined. We also considered naming some of the clinics, but that would have meant leaving out the strongest criticisms you've heard. And we decided we'd rather give you the full picture and let you make up your own mind about individual clinics if you ever come across them. I think this is a failing, to my mind, of the systems because there should be caps around it, I think. I mean, building in a cap on the extra amount that you're allowed to charge, I think, would go a long way towards resolving all this. But that will never happen. Because, you know, as well as I do, once people have been used to making a certain amount of money, they're not going to give that up very easily. But capping specialists' fees isn't the only idea getting around. A lot of people throw up their hands. They see this as an intractable problem or just wait for this wave to go away. No, no, it's not. You say there is a solution. Yes. I'm Dr. Diane Grocott. I'm a psychiatrist. I've been doing psychiatry for about 30 years, but I've only been involved with ADHD for about 10. And I run um, an internet ADHD clinic. How many patients do you have? Probably about 800. Just you? Yes, I've got people on my books who I've seen. A lot of them are back with their GPs. So the GP is managing the medication and they'll come back and see me in two years' time for a review for their permit. So Diane's clinic is mostly online, but her assessments are face-to-face. 
Also, her fees are not thousands of dollars. They're closer to the out-of-pocket cost of seeing a GP. And the reason you're hearing from her is that two years ago, she had a bad day, or two bad days, really, that led her to an idea for how to fix this. 2021, I opened my books for literally 48 hours and we had 70 new referrals. I reckon I went into emotional paralysis. I can't choose who's going to get fed because I was looking at all these, even if it's one paragraph. This is a student in year 12. They desperately have ADHD. If we could get them some medication, then they can probably get their uni course. Or this person has a, an ice problem and if they could have their ADHD treated, they might be able to get off the drugs and not go to jail. I, I was using meth about three years, three and a half years, but that was like everyday use. People were using it to get that massive dopamine release, and I was using it to just feel normal. I just felt leveled instead of so frantic all the time. I was extremely different from everybody else, and I knew something wasn't right, and I just didn't know where to go to talk to people about it. After that 48 hours of being forced to make a series of impossible choices, she decided to look beyond her clinic, at the bigger picture. I connected with lots of other colleagues and said, we need to change the system. There aren't enough psychiatrists to see all the patients who need to be seen. We've got to get ADHD treatment into primary care, back into primary care, where it used to be 30 years ago. And to do that, though, you need trained GPs. So the whole point of this idea to train GPs is to take the pressure off psychiatry as a whole. Remembering that underneath all this is a pretty basic supply and demand problem. Like it is more complicated than the toilet paper thing, but the fundamentals are the same. In fact, Diane says GPs can already do more for ADHD patients than most of them realise. But for the moment, they're afraid to. It can be quite frustrating because um, the bulk billing doctor I went to, I felt like there was a little bit of disdain. There was, I, 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 I can't say this 100%, but I, I did feel like he kind of just looked at me wanting to get stimulants when I came to him with a, like, hey, I have ADHD. What is it that GPs are afraid of? There's the stigma being seen as an easy mark, so then all the drug addicts will come saying, I've got ADHD, can you please prescribe for me? The fact that dealing with ADHD well takes time and sometimes it's just lack of training. Training GPs isn't the whole idea, though. The other half is more controversial. Trained GPs, probably credentialed, so they've sat an exam and they are safe to be able to treat ADHD with all of the comorbidities and initiate medication without that patient having to see a psychiatrist. It's actually skilling up all GPs, but some GPs having been credentialed to be allowed to initiate permits. And empowering select GPs to prescribe someone with ADHD stimulants in the first place would be a big change which would most likely attract some critics because a lot of doctors and policymakers feel passionately about maintaining the existing controls. Although you can see how Diane's idea might have helped Anita last year when her supply of meds was dwindling and clinic after clinic hung up on her. The healthcare system needs to wake up and do a better job because you wouldn't treat cancer patients like this. You just wouldn't. This is very different to cancer. But still, we have a right to access what we need. You know, you wouldn't just hang up on a a cancer patient who needed help. The suicide rate is higher in people with ADHD, particularly those who have ADHD and substance use. And there's some good research to show that untreated ADHD on average will reduce a person's life expectancy for about a decade. So it's a real disorder. And that statistic, that untreated ADHD can reduce your life expectancy by 10 years, did stick with me. Diane only mentioned it very briefly in our interview, but for weeks afterwards I found myself wondering how many years ADHD might have wiped off my life. Because I'm in my 30s and I only just got a diagnosis. So I looked up the study. It wasn't huge, but it was peer-reviewed. And the same pattern is backed up in other research, albeit without the drama of a specific number of years lost. It's not one thing that's causing this either. It's the way ADHD can impact drinking, smoking, drug use, exercise, eating, sleep. So the health risks come from multiple directions and they all add up. On the upside, the same research suggests treatment can turn that around. A 
again. That's if you can get it. You go to a GP with like a sore foot, straight away you're referred to the podiatrist and you get your foot fixed, don't you? But when you've got ADHD, it's like you just ring around forever and just get told no. <laughs> you're just in yeah, no man's land. So I'm still waiting to get onto a psychiatrist. And what I'm about to say might sound at first like hollow optimism, ruthlessly deployed at the end of a story to strategically cheer you up. But attitudes to ADHD and how we prioritise it are changing, not just on social media. It's also happening at the highest levels of government and the medical profession. The most convincing sign so far, I think, is a Senate inquiry into ADHD that's on at the moment. It's actually covering a lot of what we've been talking about, access to assessments, access to meds. It's even going to consider whether ADHD should be covered by the NDIS, but what it recommends and how the government chooses to respond to those recommendations is a whole other question. We will know more about how much concrete change is likely after September when we see that report. And until then, I hope you like hold music. This episode of Schmeitgeist was made by me, Angela Voipierre, with additional reporting by Elsa Silberstein for ABC Everyday and for The Health Report. The incredible Grant Walter is our sound designer and producer. Our next episode is something of a return to core values, by which I mean we'll be tearing apart the horror genre rather than the health system to find out why gore and spookiness seem to be so popular right now, as well as what that says about us. You can subscribe on the ABC Listen app, where you'll also find part one of our investigation into the ADHD wave, if you are the kind of chaos agent who chose to listen backwards. No judgment. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.